Good morning and good afternoon and good day, my loved one family. How appropriate it is that this day shall be celebrated as one of the first recognized federal holidays that we get to celebrate together for our honored guest that I have here today. I've been looking forward to this opportunity. I can't say enough times to have this guest here. She's a true woman of substance, a leader, an innovator. She is a proud mother of two and a fur baby residing currently in Los Angeles. Fur babies we can't forget. And she is the an acting CEO as well as the vice president of strategic partnerships. When I tell you accomplishments and a woman of substance, I can't tell you she has worked with the NBA, Chris Paul, LA Lakers, the Los Angeles Rams, Amazon, Geico, Chris Paul, the list goes on and on of her accomplishments. It's an honor for me as a man to have her here today as one of my first women guests that have such substance to her name. Ladies and gentlemen, our One Love family from Maker's Bar, creating one million liters at a time today for tomorrow. Please help me and support uh, welcoming Nikita Newell Hall. Nikita, my beautiful, thank you so much for joining us today. It's truly an honor. Wow, that was such an amazing introduction. Thank you so much. I'm honored and I'm humbled to be here uh, on this amazing Juneteenth Wednesday uh, to share in this lovely conversation with you. Thank you so much. We are, I know you are, with all the things that you have as a list of your accomplishments, I appreciate you taking out the time to spend it with us. And as beautiful as you look today, I just want to please humbly put that compliment out there that we have the honor of having you with your beautiful face with us today. Thank you. It's certainly mutual. So kind of you to invite me and I could not accept fast enough. Thank you so much. So Nikita, tell us, uh, how did you end up here? Tell us about, a little bit about your start and where you came from. Absolutely. So I grew up in Compton, California, and I was oh, yeah. raised primarily by my mom, Leanna Johnson, who's no longer with us. And she laid a great example for me on just how to exist in this world and how to dream and reach my dreams. So that's really the beginning of my story. And I... After graduation, went to Grambling State University, which again is a huge, huge part of my growth and development uh, as a professional because I started working in entertainment right at Grambling State University in radio, in TV news. And the university really did a great job of exposing us to the industry. And then right after that, um, I had an internship at the National Basketball Association, went on to work there for several years after my internship was complete. And then I just went from there to Nike, to consulting uh, with brands like Gatorade and HBO, and uh, did a little bit of talent producing, which is handling everything that a talent would need on a set. So that was a big part of my career, just working with celebrities, influencers, um, and just creating real relationships that could be later translated into incredible marketing campaigns and just long-term brand affinity. Uh, and then sitting in the seat today as a chief strategy officer at Shoes That Fit, um, I was the acting CEO for about three months while our CEO was on sabbatical. So um, I kind of got here by working with Usher and his New Look Foundation that really introduced me to this world of philanthropy and after that, I decided that I would love to transition my career to working mostly in philanthropy and using all of these sports, entertainment, and corporate relationships for social good. And so that's what I'm able to do today. Fantastic. Now tell me what led you into this field? Was there a particular mentor you had in mind or that was in your life that encouraged you to step out into philanthropy on your own business? Or was there a woman of the past considering it's Juneteenth that would, has influenced you toward this road? I mean, I think all of my life I've kind of been on this road of influence. I've always looked up to incredible African-American women who have despite the odds, achieved huge levels of success. So Shirley Chisholm is one of my favorite all-time oh. iconic heroes, um, mainly because she had the audacity, audacity. to, to uh, put herself forward 
to seek to be the very first woman, period, to seek a nomination of a major party and then be the first African American woman in Congress during the day and age where it just was not thought uh, to be feasible. She did not have um, a woman of color, a black woman that she could look to to say, hey, I want to be like that person. So I really think that world less traveled is really my guiding star, my guiding light. I love exploring things that haven't been done that necessarily um, that uh, I've been the first to do. I mean, pretty much every career I've had, I'm the first person to hold that role, um, particularly as it was structured for me. And so I have to look back at people like her to say, okay, what did they, what did she do? What hurdles did she face? What must that inner voice have been for her to give her the audacity, the tenacity, the strength, the courage to set these really high goals and to achieve them, to simply like not be denied is um, just something that I, that has helped me in general in shaping my career. And, and definitely as I decided to step over into philanthropy. Now you mentioned audacity and courage. I think audacity is a, a term that I don't know that a lot of women of color necessarily get, but women of color, black women have audacity, but channeling that audacity, what was the spark that gave you that uh, in addition to those mentors, audacity, talking about that term in particular? No, absolutely. For me, it is signaling that, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> the presence of mind to believe that you could, under any circumstance, achieve this thing. Yes. How audacious of you to, to believe that. And so that gets me really excited because I'm always seeing that sort of audacious place as a challenge and um, one that we have proven time and again to accept um, and then exceed all expectations. So yeah, I think audacity is truly one of the words that I would use to describe what you need, what you need to be able to create space and take up space and to make your mark in the world in general, but specifically in, in corporate America. Um, I think that is something that I would definitely want to leave with your audience. And, and tell us a little bit about your first career job that seemed to have been directing you toward where you're at now. What was your first job that you kind of got the inspiration or you knew, okay, so this is the direction I'm going? <laughs> so this is kind of funny. So, I mean, do you want to know like my first, first job ever or my first <laughs> job in my career? Because <laughs> they both sort of played a role, but one of them isn't sexy and one of them kind of is more sexy. So let's hear both. I'm good to hear both. So my first job ever, first job ever, I was 15, back when you could start working at 16. But oh, I yeah. sort of fudged my birthday a little bit and said that I was 16, but I was really 15 when I started working at McDonald's in uh, Gardena, California. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I just did everything from, you know, flip burgers to work the cashier, uh, the cash register. And... Uh, I just wanted to be able to afford a pair of guest jeans and a Liz Claiborne purse <laughs> and, uh, and uh, some bamboo earrings, which are now back. I mean, that was my whole goal. <laughs> yeah. buy some clothes. And working there taught me so many things. Um, responsibility. It helped me have a sense of pride that I could now you know, earn this money, that I could choose to steward any way I wanted to. But it also showed me something that I did not want. I knew that I did not want to be working in a position where the salary was not great and could only be so much, right? Um, particularly as an hourly worker at that time. I mean, now you can make like $20 an hour at McDonald's. I mean, <laughs> back then we were probably making like $4 and change, maybe, right? Um, I also knew that I wanted to have more control uh, over my life, over what hours I worked, um, over the type of people that I would interact with, right? So it was a very humbling experience. It was very, uh, it was fun, uh, but it did teach me that, okay, I think I wanna 
pursue something uh, more professional. Now, had I had I had any sense, I would have gone on to Hamburg University and bought a McDonald's franchise, right? Right. I really been with oh, it. Yeah. But I Coming to America. Oh, come on. Right? <laughs> and I think that is that young women today can. You know, I met yes. a young lady the other day and her staff who is um, a black woman owner of a Chick-fil-A here in L.A. on 7th and Spring. Beautiful, beautiful young woman. Right. And so those uh, opportunities and possibilities are limitless and they're there. So that was my very first job. And then my very first career center job was at the National Basketball Association. I started off working in operations, which is interesting. And another really amazing lesson so starting out for me, um, I was an intern there first. And what sparked my internship was not sports. I was not very interested in sports. And I often tell people I had never even watched a full basketball game when I went to work at the NBA. I couldn't tell you about any of the players. I knew Michael Jordan. I knew I grew up in L.A. So I knew like the starting five, you know, Magic, Kareem, Michael Cooper. like that. But other than that, I could not tell you anything about the sport. But what was intriguing to me was the business aspect of the game. Mm -hmm. I All thought right. here is a genius marketing company. They happen to be marketing the sport, which is basketball. So I was more interested in what was going on behind the scenes and the licensing deals and the, um, how they were structuring the contracts with the players. I was interested in just everything that was going on behind the scenes. And so I had an opportunity to work in operations. And at that time, they, um, NBA Entertainment had a brand new, beautiful production facility. And my job was to sell all of the NBA's space, the production space, the editing bays, as well as their creative services. So back during this time, you know, the NFL uh, was doing a really good job of you know, making the NFL really cool and successful in terms of music and editing. And so the NBA sort of had this idea that they could be like the MTV of sports. And they really did become that. And they did. I remember that. That was in particular. So they have the music, they have the celebrities, they make the players um, appear in a really cool, hip way. And so my job was to say, hey, you know, the NBA is doing this for its own franchises and its own brand we can do that for anybody, whether you're McDonald's or Clorox or whatever. So that was my very first job. So selling the production space and the creative services to anybody who wanted it. While I was there, I kind of looked across the hall and I saw this amazing woman who is my mentor to this day, Leah Wilcox. And she was the head of player talent relations. And uh, that group was really responsible for being the liaison between the league and the players. So whenever they needed a player for any sort of collaboration or activation, think stay in school program promos, or there was a marketing partner and they needed a player to be in a commercial, or they had several own properties like Inside Stuff and NBA Action. So content that they created with their players. Uh, but all this content was driven around personality. So there had to be a group within the organization who knew the personalities of the players and who would be good for what. So as an example, we'd say, hey, well, we know Carmelo grew up in Monroe and he's a country boy at heart and has a farm, as an example. We should go shoot him. And so that would sort of be my role. Once I met Leah and saw what her team did, I did everything in my power to work in player and talent relations. And then we also, uh, as well as being the liaison for the league, we became the liaison to the entertainment industry. So if the anyone within the league wanted a celebrity participate in something or they needed a song for, for a video, any sort of entertainment celebrity collaboration, they would come to our group and we would make those connections, do those deals and forge those partnerships. So that was my very first job out of school and my very first sort of real foray into creating partnerships, into leveraging celebrity and influencers. And I did start there, interestingly enough, working with the players in a lot of their off-court activities, a lot of their charitable 
organizations. And so they would come to us and say, hey, doing this basketball camp for inner city, kid, inner city kids, I need NBA balls or I need NBA t-shirts. So now that I think about it, that was sort of really my first introduction um, to working on charitable causes with players. Now, I'm curious, because during that time, you being really uh, one of the leaders in that field at the time, your women uh, colleagues, female colleagues, how how did that look like during the time you were coming up, making these propositions and making these connections? Were there many women of color at that time? I'd be very curious. And, and I know it's easy for us to right away say there were a few, but had you seen any during your business partnerships and the beginning of your career during that time? Well, within the NBA, let me talk about that specifically. There was one um, from a leadership perspective, and she was my boss. And so I really did learn from Leah, like how to navigate that world. Uh, there were other women of color and other Black women in more junior roles, if you will. And again, they were few and far between. As we were navigating the outside world, sort of outside of that enterprise, talking to record companies and record labels, in that instance, there were several more women, still not a ton, but there were other Black women that we would collaborate with who would be product managers, they'd be head of marketing, head of A&R, there would be publicists who would be other Black women that we would interface with. But again, within their systems, so if they worked at Sony Music or if they worked at MGM Studios, they would be one of a small handful of women within their, within their um, enterprise. And are some of those women still with the league? Because I heard heard and read not too long ago, the, the Black women in particular within the NBA, it seems to be an increase in as far as their uh, visibility and leadership roles. Is that the case where some of those women are with you today in st some of those positions as well? Yes, I would definitely say that. I think as challenging as it has been through the years, there has been somewhat of an effort from the league. I know when I was working there. My then, well, my boss's boss, Don Sperling, who's with the Giants right now, is an amazing man who took me under his wing as well. Don came to me and he fully acknowledged that there was a problem within the league, particularly with sourcing amazing talent and um, women talent and women of color, particularly black women. And so he came to me and I was able to access my resources and my network. And I was able to get several black women hired um, at, at the NBA. And again, that was just Don and I working together. Since then, they have an entire coalition that they have created and oh, network what? to really not only, so remember, recruitment is only one part of making your workforce more diverse and more equitable. Where are the people? Where are the qualified people of color? Where are the qualified Black women? That's one part. Let's get them into our system. That's the second part. The third part is really making sure that you fostered an environment and a culture of inclusivity and of opportunity. And so I believe now that they have more of a system in place um, led by one of my dear friends, Corey Davis Porter, who is still um, there at the NBA. She was my roommate when I was working there. Um, so this must be 20 plus years for her. And so they really have, I believe just based on what I see, made some inroads. Um, I do believe they still have a ways to go, um, but it's far different than it was when I was there in a good way. Or, uh, that's what I was going to ask. In a good way, it's far different. So you've seen the improvements and the changes currently. I really have. And again, I think, you know, I don't want to send them a, a incomplete message. The message is 100%. If I walk those halls today, I think the number of, Black women and the number of Black women in higher roles will definitely be more than what it was when I was there several years ago. Is it on par with where it actually should be, right? And I think that's more of a question for the women who are actually still working there today. Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable passing along third or fourth party information, but I do think it's a brilliant conversation that we need to have and to make sure that we are consistently improving those inroads and also that sustainability pipeline. Now, uh, if if this, I'm, I'm thinking this is somewhat a related question, but as it relates to WNBA, 
are there women of color in leadership in the WNBA? Or if, if you would know of that, I would have, I'm assuming so by asking that question. I'd be very curious. No, yes, that's a wonderful question. And I love the WNBA. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity to make space for um, that league and the incredible women who not only are playing in the league, some incredible, amazing basketball. Some of the best Absolutely. basketball you'll probably see is uh, right there on those WNBA courts. Oh, don't get it twisted, sis. Look, uh, early on when the dudes used to tease me for going to Clipper games, I was going to WNBA games as well. And those games, though, I kid you not, those were some of the most fun, exciting, real challenge basketball games going to WNBA. I've been a long proponent of that. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm interested. I know we have some new uh, interest of late with the two players, Caitlin, Right. And Angela, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not one of these Johnny come latelys to WNBA. And no, I love that. I, I, that's why you oh, yeah. my people. I love that. <laughs> I have partnerships with the LA Sparks. Uh, I was just in Chicago two or three weeks ago with the Chicago Sky. I've done activations with the Las Vegas Aces, and I'm looking to definitely expand our portfolio of WNBA relationships. Um, but yeah, definitely in team leadership, I have seen some women of color, particularly black women. And um, again, like I would have to defer to people who are working at the league to really talk about their experience and sort of what the opportunities are there. But just about everybody I work with on my level um, have been uh, either black people or black women. Um, and of course, Dallas Mavs, I mean, you can't ignore the yeah. incredible leadership they have over there. So definitely making some good strides in the right direction that we have to be sure to keep our foot on the gas, that we have to be sure that we are handling off these mantles to the next generation of leaders, which is why I was so happy to be a part of this podcast, not only sharing our stories, because I think that is such a huge part of people being able to dream. Uh, about what they could do and be and accomplish, seeing someone already doing it, right? So that's important. Absolutely. But also creating those relationships so that we can mentor, train, advise, and inspire um, people to be ready to, to step into these roles um, as, as they become available. Now, if you don't mind, somewhat related, but switching gears a little, describe shoes that fit. Describe Absolutely. its origin and how, how it goes, because uh, I first of all, the name and as uh, we mentioned a pre conversation, I did my homework. <laughs> You're such a great student. I have to say that you are on the homework 100 uh, percent. We didn't yes. even get to the podcast yet. We didn't even get oh. to the podcast yet. <laughs> That's funny. So Shoes That Fit is a national nonprofit. We've been around for more than 30 years. It's an organization that was founded by one woman, Elodie. She was working on the administrative staff at a local college in the Claremont area, was at a lunch one day and overheard a school nurse talking about, she was late to the dinner, I mean, to the lunch. And so she was just telling her friends, oh, I'm so sorry, I was late. I got called, um, uh, I had to stay late because it was a young boy who they could not get to stop crying. They brought him to my office. I checked him out. I didn't see anything, but he was steadily crying, but I took his shoes off. And as it turns out, his his big toes, his toes had been folded under to shove. You would say big toes. We used to big toes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all those toes were folded under. And they just his parents sort of shoved his shoes on and sent him to school like that. So they found that when they removed the shoes, it relieved the pain. Um, and so Elodie, who was our founder, turned around and said, Okay, well, what did you do? Right after that. So the nurse replied, I did the only thing I could. Um, I massaged his feet a little bit. Then I kind of turned his toes back under and shoved his shoes back on. So Elodie's thinking like, that's pretty barbaric. Like, why didn't you just get him another pair of shoes? The nurse helped her understand. I work in an inner city school. We don't have those type of resources. And by the way, oh, by the way, since we're here, do you know how many children I have in that very same predicament? And there's no way I could help all those kids. So long story short, Elodie got the name of that child, and the most in need children at that school turned out to be about 40 or so children. And she made a bulletin board in her office and she put each child's name on the board with their shoe size and asked her colleagues, her fellow coworkers, if they would each take a, a, a card 
and go buy shoes for those kids. And they brought them back to her office and she distributed them. That was the start of Shoes That Fit um, at a school here locally in Pomona, California. So we went from helping, really being inspired by that one boy, hearing his story, wow. to um, as of today, helping 180,000 children per year um, nice. on uh, working on a strategic plan to help over half a million children over the next um, five to 10 years. So. So yeah, so that's shoes that fit. We help kids nationwide receive brand new shoes for school. We're focusing on kids who are precariously housed or experiencing homelessness, children in foster care, uh, and just children whose parents are having a hard time making those ends meet. And they need a little help from the community to solve this very basic need, a pair of shoes, uh, which for us, it's more than the shoes. The shoes are an entryway, it's an entry point. It's a basic need that we can meet but really we hope that we're instilling confidence. We hope that we're bringing a lot of joy into the schools and to the children. And more than anything, we're hoping that they're able to participate in sport. We've talked a lot about sports here um, in our conversation so far, but we hope that we're enabling them to be active on the playground and on the field. You, you mentioned something that's very near and dear to my heart. I am a child of adoption and one of 18 children. Whoa. Uh, how amazing. Yes. I tell you, my my mom being a black, black Puerto Rican from New York. Oh, oh <laughs> you got it all. <laughs> you oh, got it yeah. All. <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. And I tell you, so that's near and dear to my heart. Describe some of your philanthropy and or your relationships with some of the foster care community. I, I really would like to hear some of that shared of you. No, absolutely. So you work with foster care agencies nationwide. Right. So any foster care agency can pretty much call us up. And as long as we have a donor or we have the resources, we can help those children receive the shoes that they need. We also work with the school administration. So they often know the children in their system, in their school, who are um, foster children and whose foster parents may need a little extra help. And so those children really do receive the, the priority. And so I'm I'm also curious to follow up with that a little bit. Primarily, these schools are in the Los Angeles area or California, or are they we're also nationwide. national? Yeah, we're national. So we work in all 50 states. And our major and sort of basic indicator of need is the amount of children who are on the free and reduced meal programs. So we go into a community, usually it's going to be a community that's under-resourced, um, a community that sort of needs extra help. Usually the kids that we're serving are like 70, 80, 90 percent, 100 percent of all the kids are on the free and reduced meal program. So that's kind of how we determine which schools we go into. When we go in with so partners, if we go in with like a Mercedes Benz or Nordstrom was an amazing partner of ours um, or with the Chris Paul Foundation or, you know, any other sort of athlete, then oftentimes they can decide where they want to help. You know, sometimes they want to help in the community where they grew up. And so it can be donor directed or we we uh, can find the school um, ourselves or it doesn't even have to be a school. I also have partnerships with Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, one of my biggest projects right now is Girls on the Run, helping sure helping to ensure that inner city girls can run and have really good running shoes. So we work in schools. That's the main way we work. But we also work uh, with other nonprofits who are delivering services to kids in need. Now, you mentioned Boys and Girls Club. I know the YMCA has a huge female basketball league as well. Are you familiar, are you working with YMCA and other nonprofits in along with Boys and Girls or in conjunction? So we haven't as of yet, I don't think, my team would have to like remind me if we have, worked with the YMCAs, although I'd totally be open to that. It's mainly been the Boys and Girls Clubs because, again, a lot of the donors that we work with have identified that they want to help um, with the Boys and Girls Clubs. So that's sort of how Fantastic. we forge those relationships. Yes. And that's just out of curiosity, right. somewhat right. prejudice. Yeah. And having worked with the YMCA for about 12, 15 years myself, and I, I know Boys and Girls Club and YMCA tend to have their somewhat sibling rivalry, but they do a lot of the same work. So that was just out of curiosity. Oh, and yeah. And I would love to work with them. I mean, obviously, Boys and Girls Clubs have a lot of support. They have a lot of late name recognition, a lot of celebrity support. And uh, yeah, we would love to work with the YMCA. So maybe you can make those connections. Oh, you know what? I, I, I got you. I got you. I'm still definitely a volunteer with them. I worked in a program called Youth in Government and Youth in Government was a, 
a real big baby of mine where in the YMCA, we worked in partnership with the schools and uh, my goal was to help get school credit for a lot of our students in addition to the volunteer credits that they would get for entering college and the amount of young black women and, and black men for that matter, youth and government helped to give them not only an education and civic duty or civic responsibility, but in understanding our government. And their sports program was how I re, uh, recruited some of the young women that participate in our youth and government program. It's definitely an organization near and dear to my heart. Oh, and I so love we would that. we can definitely we can definitely make those connections. And and as I mentioned earlier, part of my goal and Maker's Bar's goal is to create and establish some of those partnerships to further our goal of creating one million leaders. So we definitely can talk on that. And besides which, you and I are not going to stop talking after this conversation. Oh, anyway. this is the beginning. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. And congratulations oh, yes. on that government work. You know, I think, especially from a philanthropic standpoint, government is so critically important in terms of making sure that young people, young Black people specifically, have access to understanding how our government works. Sure. And from a philanthropic standpoint, uh, policy is so critically important to how we Absolutely. get some of these services that we need um, to the people who need them. So I love the idea of teaching them about government. Um, I've done some advocacy work in the cancer space and I've done yeah. some um, congressional briefings. And it's just really important to, again, make sure we have a pipeline of people who can participate Absolutely. in the political process on any level, but definitely um, on the policy and advocacy level as well. Absolutely. In, in interest in that direction, it was some of your activities outside of your work. What are some of those, if they're related to your professional career and or just your hobbies and loves that you do outside of this particular valuable work? Yes. No. So outside of shoes that fit, I mean, I have a dual career, so I still consult in um, the talent celebrity space. So if brands need celebrities to appear in commercials or to be influencers for particular projects, they can call me for that. I also co-own an agency called Strut, where we help with oh, marketing, that. monetization, um, and uh, our clients are for-profit and for a purpose. Um, so we can advise on any part of the nonprofit business structure, as well as for-profits helping launching new products, um, helping to attract new customers, uh, particularly if you're going to leverage any sort of marketing tool. And then uh, uh, on, a, on a personal kind of fun level, I have this really quirky little podcast with my dear friend, Muhammad el -Mujib. I was going to get to that. <laughs> so we, you know, so we're setting up guests for the podcast and we're recording that as our just fun kind of pet project. And then just sort of on a more personal level where business is not even a consideration. Uh, I'm a true lover of the arts. So wherever there's music, live music, particularly wherever there's a museum or some sort of really interesting curated experience, you can find me there. And my favorite place in the world is to be uh, on the beach somewhere with the ocean in front of me. And oh, see. Like look, mine. look, just, just see, Nikita. <laughs> That's my, my so, spot. So, so it's definitely that in my bio, if we were on, I forget the dating sites or what have you. So we have to put long, long walks along the beach and that will yes. kind of get a. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yes, so you are the truly ocean that woman. always calling my name. So, if they, you know, they always say, um, are you, do you prefer the ocean or the mountains? I always pick ocean. So, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm an, I'm an ocean boy, you know, there's sometimes, sometimes near the ocean, I can't mention on this podcast, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> We're tracking. We're tracking. <laughs> but no, I, I think that is, it is wonderful to hear that. I think it's, it's some of our natural resources here in California. It's heard often. California is beautiful, but it's just simply said that way. And it's not really seen. There is some beautiful, incredible views from the ocean portion that I think are absolutely incredible. Absolutely. 100%. Incredible. I could not agree more. This is my favorite place. And I was discussing with a friend the other day, no matter where I go in the world, I have to have a round trip ticket. And, you know, L.A. is just it for me, you know, for all the most amazing reasons from the, the people to the food to our natural uh, resources, food. you know, it's all here. 
Oh yeah, it is. So now I want to go back a little bit. Strut. Does that are the, those uh, words meaning something? Are they short for something? Yes. So it's not an acronym necessarily, but our motto is that we help you strut, or you can stay stuck. And so, oh, oh, oh I like that. <laughs> Strutting forward. It's it's really a nod to the fact that you know we can help you show up in the marketplace in a way that a separates you from the competition but that B allows you to have a kind of swagger and gravitas that um, is gonna enable you to strut forward. So that's really where it comes oh, from. Like and that's that. the brainchild of my amazing partner, Dr. Tashawn Macon. Oh, fantastic. So strut, how long has strut been in existence? Uh, about 20 years now. Um, and we have worked with so many amazing brands. Right now, we have a couple of clients, uh, Women's Foundation of the South, who's working for the health, wealth, and power of women of color, focusing and centering on Black women in the South. Um, we, interestingly enough, which I love this fact, but we have had two clients while they were our clients receive huge transformational McKinsey Scott gifts. One received $100 million, the other received $140 million wow. gift with 20 million of that being unrestricted. And so, so we're really about helping organizations transform, but also position themselves in a way that they attract the attention of some of our most um, philanthropic donors. So yeah, that's Strut. Oh, that's incredible. Now, does Strut and or shoes that fit young women that might be interested in you becoming their mentor and or the organization organization giving them a mentorship or internship opportunities are those something that are current going on or you're looking toward in the future or is that something i'm speaking to pre uh too early about no absolutely at strut i can speak to uh more uh uh more succinctly because i'm a co-owner in that we are, most of our staff is young Black women. So at any given time, we have a staff from 10 to 20 people based in LA, New York, Atlanta, uh, Australia, uh, the Philippines. Um, the Philippines. Chicago. Yes. So we do a really good job of sourcing talent all over the world, depending on what our clients, our, our clients are, uh, need base are. So a lot of our tech support is coming um, out of some of those places. Then Tashawn is doing an incredible job of stewarding uh, those members of our team. Our, uh, our goal is to be able to create something that we could leave behind for future generations with Strut. And so we take it very seriously to be mentoring college students, um, women who are young in their career and maybe looking to consult. Um, so there's actually financial opportunities when we're hiring them on as consultants, but then just as mentors, I mean, Tashawn and I have a long list of people who we've just helped uh, by being a listening ear, sharing some of our experiences, and we're not afraid to pick up the phone and make introductions and um, help people get ready for interviews, look at resumes. I mean, we spend a lot of time um, cultivating the next generation of young Black female talent. As shoes that fit, we don't really have an internship program right now, per se, uh, but I did have a wonderful conversation with a young lady who uh, was referred to me by a friend of our organization who was looking to pivot into nonprofit. And so I try to make myself available to have those conversations when people reach out to me. The other thing that I really am very conscious of doing is if I can't, meaning either um, I try not to make it about my schedule because you can really make time, but sometimes the volume of people who need resources, um, I have a, such a beautiful network of women that I can match them up with other people if I'm not available in that in that time where they need some sort of help or resource. Oh, fantastic. Now, uh, along those lines, I'm, I'm also very fascinated by this. Is there a particular age bracket that you target that can enter into these mentorship programs or do they uh, do an application process once they turn a certain age? Is there something along those lines? So, no, it's for, for the projects that I'm working on, it's not that formal. It's usually people just reaching out to us either on LinkedIn, like you did, or <laughs> uh, finding us as being recommended by other colleagues of ours. 
uh, I think our sweet spot is 18 and over. I mean, okay. obviously, I mean, I have a 17 year old teenage daughter, so I definitely understand. Oh. Voice, but however, <laughs> yeah. I think based on the business expertise, usually it's those young women entering into college, um, wanting to understand how to navigate uh, that world. And also looking at like, what should I be studying? You know, if I need an internship, where should I go? Who can I call? Can you help me? Um, and then definitely those young women who are seasoned in their career. Uh, I talk to young women, black women all the time who may have had a level of success, perhaps they're in their mid twenties and they've done all the stuff, they've done all the grunt work, they've shown up early, they've stayed late. And now they're just really ready to level up their career and they need help. You know, they need mentorship. Um, Tashawn actually wrote an incredible book that's out right now. It's a bestseller. It's on Amazon called Let's Coming In it. Hot. Yeah, it's Coming In Hot. It's a blueprint for Black women setting the world ablaze. And she coming in hot. Really incredible coming in hot. It's amazing for- We got to get her for an interview too. Oh, you have to have Tashawn on. You will be blown away. She is- Equal parts funny, engaging, a brilliant academic, the woman of faith. She um, has a PhD. She, I mean, oh. yeah, coming in hot, Dr. Tashawn Macon. Everybody get it. <laughs> and then you have her on. I, I'm writing it. I'm writing it down. And coming then you call me now. for all the other guests that you need. And I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already putting a star blank. Make sure to contact Nikita. <laughs> <laughs> to all the people. Oh yeah, um, uh, I lost my question. Oh, so uh, I I see. I just want to make sure on your end. I seem to have a little uh, pause, and I just want to make sure on your end that we're checking that out. Is there any pause on your end? Nope, it's very fluid okay. on my side. Fantastic. Okay, so um, now you mentioned uh, your music and the arts, and just before I tag into that young women who are becoming entrepreneurs, uh, young black women, young, and for that matter, black men, we see our women leadership uh, and it's extremely understood in our community that women are founding leaders of our clans, so to speak. What are the words of encouragement you give to those young women? And then as a woman of color, what are those things you would say to men? Because I think if I speak so frankly, there is a gap in communication, I think, sometimes, and a misunderstanding on within our community, we see the heroinism of the Black women in our community as Black men and Black women. And the external conversation sometimes is that communication is not happening. I have seen it happen with my mom and women that have been instrumental in my life. I'm curious for you, what are some of those communication links you would see a, to give to young women of color who are looking to be in entrepreneurial positions and or philanthropy. And then you as a woman of color, we'll get to the dating part later for men of substance, but <laughs> but hey, young men who are coming up. <laughs> no, 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 we will. It's so good. So number one, for Black women, young women who want to be in entrepreneurship. So one of my favorite books that I read in... 92, I think when it came out, or 93, I was graduating college, and it's Think and Grow Rich, The Black Choice. Oh. And oh, is so such... may, I, may I ask if Please. may I interrupt? So it's a takeoff of Napoleon Hill's book, but from a black it's Napoleon Hill and uh Dennis, they come together to write this amazing book. Um, I know that. yes, no, it's Think and Grow Rich, The Black Choice. I think it has probably two or three iterations since the one that I read. So incredible book, but the number one quote that I saw that I carry with me to this day was this. So this is a quote from the book, but it's also my advice to young black women seeking entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial path. It says, start where you are with what you have, knowing that what you have is enough. I think that's so important because in today's society, we are led to believe that we need all these things. I have so many people calling me like, okay, I have a business. I want to name it this. And I want to incorporate my LLC and I want to, you know, um, do all these other things. And, and my advice to many of them, depending on who they are, what the idea is, is just start, just start, go to Google university, go to YouTube grad school and start. 
I mean, that's the most important thing that you can do. We can put all of the business dynamics around it once you have a thing. Because what I find is that people spend so much time, people who are not skilled in business, by the way, spend so much time on the business mechanics, but they're oftentimes don't even have the business acumen to put together that they literally just get stuck. Oh, I got a GoDaddy account. Oh, I secured the name. Oh, I registered. And then they just kind of let it languish there. So my, my advice would be to just start. Whatever that business is, whatever that idea is, that you just have to start doing it. There's so many great examples from Fawn Weaver over at Uncle Nearest to, you know, I mean, we could just go on and on about the brilliant, amazing women who are in business, whether it's on the entertainment side, content creation, um, influencers, to, you know, people who um, are in consumer goods and launching consumer goods, whether it's a shea butter brand or um, whether it's, you know, press on nails. The opportunity is like I have never seen it before. You know, when I was growing up, they would tell us, you can do anything. You could be anything. Now, this is before I had seen Barack Obama in office. It was before, you know, we had really seen the full realization of what, you know, Miss Oprah Winfrey would later come on, come, come to, to become before all of that. But they were instilling in us, you can do, you can be. And so it was an idea and it was a, a faith that we had in our God, A, but then also in our own inner constitution that we could do and be these things. But this is what I love for this generation is that they have so many examples. Absolutely. Whether it's Bloody Vegan and what they've done in entrepreneurship or Tabitha oh, Brown. Yeah. Right. So, so my, my first piece of advice is to start. My second piece of advice as it relates to being in philanthropy, I think it's so important to number one. The first thing you want to do is if you want to be in philanthropy, and that's twofold, either working at a nonprofit, and that's the organization that is providing the services directly to the people who need them. They're raising the money and they're providing the service. So whether it's a food bank or food insecurity that you're working on, if you're working on housing insecurity, if you're working on financial equity, whatever the social problem is that you're looking to solve, right? From a nonprofit perspective, number one is you should volunteer. If you don't know mm -hmm. where to start, you don't know what to do, you need to be passionate about a cause. Whatever that cause is, you need to educate yourself on what this problem is right? You need to know what have we done so far as a society to address this problem? And what are the organizations who are really making inroads to solve it? And then you need to volunteer with them. You need to sign up to sit on a board. And, and this is one thing that I don't think young women, especially young Black women, are thinking about because you think of board and you're like, oh my God, that sounds so scary. But the reality is, if you don't have the professional experience to be able to sit on a, a, a governing board. There are advisory boards, which just means like, hey, these are a group of people who have a certain set of expertise. Maybe you know social media really well, right? And you're going to sit on an advisory board. You're not going to govern the organization. However, you are going to be a part of helping them to excel in a particular area where your expertise can be used and needed. Now, what is that gonna do? It's gonna put you in an environment where you're starting to learn the terminology. You're starting to learn like, how do the how do these this money gets translated into these goods and then the people get helped, right? So you're in the setting, right? If on the second part of philanthropy, you're looking to more or less work for a foundation, which means they're the people who are giving the money away so that the need can be solved then I would recommend you getting on LinkedIn, you figuring out what the biggest foundations in the world are, what are some foundations that might be in your own city, what are they looking for, go on their job boards, right? What kind of roles are they looking to fill? Who do you know that might be in a network um, that can introduce you to somebody? Uh, I think that's super uh, important. And then the last thing you asked me about was the communication between Black men and Black women as it relates to entrepreneurship and really for being sure. able to work together and those sort of communication challenges. 
I think the first thing that we have to do is understand that we need each other. Oh, first and foremost, oh. please say that again. That we need each other. It's not a matter of who's going to get there first. So if there have been more inroads made for black women, if black women have gotten more degrees, if we are sitting at the, you know, kind of top of a lot of the, you know, organizations and corporations, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. The reality is that for our posterity's sake, right, we need each other. And I think that if we stop looking at it as a competition and more as a collaboration, then we go so much farther together. I mean, some of my best friends are men who I have come up in either the entertainment industry or in the business um, sector. And there is nothing more beautiful than to be able to call a black man and say, hey, you know, I need this. <laughs> or, hey, do you know somebody and have him? I mean, every black man in my network, whether they have mentored me in college, you know, Dr. Calvin Miles or Ken James, you know, Lamont Bowles. I mean, I can go on and on and on about the amazing black men who have been mentors to me, to some of my colleagues and counterparts. It has really been us working together. Um, what we're going to realize when we take a step back and say it's not us versus you, but that it is the whole, we're going to realize that that is the way we made it this far. Absolutely. If you look at the collaboration Absolutely. between even Dr. Martin Luther King and Mrs. Coretta Scott King, it's the collaboration that got us to where we are today. You look at uh, 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 Shirley Chisholm and the amount of black men who were in her inner circle, who were helping Absolutely. to propel her forward. And so I think if we have more of a community mindset that it doesn't matter who is leading at any particular time, what really matters is are we all able to benefit and do we have the amount of love and respect for each other that we are so happy and excited to partner together for the greater good, not just for our community, but for the runoff effect that Absolutely. we did because we are influencing the United States and the world. Absolutely. Black Americans, right? Um, and so I don't think it's as big a problem as people wanted to believe, want to believe. I think it's an, a situation of what you give the most energy to magnifies. And I think there's a salaciousness to the fact that, oh, black women and black men don't get along. And if you look at the owners of most mediums, that's a great narrative for them to perpetuate. But if we I, take control of that narrative, right? And if we say, that's the case anywhere. I mean, people are gonna have conflict no matter what race you're in, people are in conflict but it's just not as salacious and entertaining and tintillating as if when we have conflict, <laughs> right? Oh, you, are, you are talking on such a, another level of conversation. And I'm just so glad that you hit these points because I too think it's a, it's a more tintillating and salacious tidbite to keep us from unifying and creating a more powerful unified force. Because I mm -hmm. do feel, at least in my relationship with black women and black brothers who we we see we don't see as much of a problem as what's perpetuated and that we do create a, a greater powerful force we see that that we're working together more often than not and i'm so glad you addressed that. Absolutely. Addressing, I think, and we see it in our I, work I, all the time you know even at spread agency i mean some of our most senior advisors and consultants on our team are very accomplished uh, very senior black men so i think that this this sort of narrative is sort of tired, it's weak, it's passe. And if we so look at I, it from that standpoint and just say, okay, our new normal is this. We collaborate, we work together, we do amazing things together. Then I think the other chatter just kind of cannibalizes itself. Um, and then we are able to tell the stories that we wanna tell about how we work together. And we have so many case studies. We do. We do. Yes. And I'm just I'm so glad that this was a focal point of our conversation, because, again, my positive experience has collaborated with women of color. And I see that we have more times than not where we are in sync in our conversation and our goals and agenda. What has been perpetuated is not a full truthful narrative. I think some of the cloud comes in with the younger generation and 
this conversation piece has been perpetuated that we don't we can't communicate and due to some of the disparity in the education levels with black women receiving higher and more frequent degrees than black men a number of those things get focused on and the focus the true focus is that in our communities we are working well together there's more good happening than not oh, and that focus does yeah, no, and I think, you know, again, if you get down to the brass tacks of it, if we have this conversation, not in mixed company, which this podcast will be in mixed company, right? Then um, I think that when we leave with empathy, right? We listen with our hearts. We listen to really Absolutely. understand. Then we see that really, and I love how you pose this question. It's a communication issue, right? It's it really is. Issues. It's our word choice. Um, it's the frustration that is bubbling up on both sides. Um, a lot of which is rooted in a lot of the inequities. So a lot of the inequities cause frustration on each part for black women and for black men. And instead of looking at the inequity as the problem, this is the issue, then oftentimes we can turn on each other and bring those frustrations into um, the conversation in a way that's not helpful. So yes. if we call the thing the thing and we um, are able to put you know, sort of find a resting place for that, then we do go forward to do amazing things together. I believe so that. I'm looking I'm forward so to more of those stories. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward. I'd like us to circle back at some point because I think communication is definitely a focal point for me as far as bridging the gap that I think a, a number of misunderstandings happen due to lack of communication. Mm -hmm. And communication, not just saying we're going to talk, but hearing and listening and patience and receptiveness. Right. And getting so to the root of the real problem. Right. Absolutely. Real, absolutely. Yeah, the problem that we're fussing about is probably not the actual problem. And again, I mean, just another, you know, spinoff ideas. I mean, just bringing some of those couples and some of those collaborators um, together to kind of talk about how they've been able to have success and how they've overcome some of those communication hurdles. I think it'd be truly absolutely. helpful, um, particularly as you look at, you know, a million leaders, so. I, I want this will be a circle back interview for us. I really want us to have that. I really do. Now, uh, changing subject somewhat, I want to hear a little more about the podcast. Give us some information on the podcast because I want other people to tune into that and hear what I've heard. No, absolutely. So our podcast is called The Soul Chronicles, S-O-L-E. And it's really exploring the life and times of Muhammad al-Muhajur and Nikita Newell Hall in the sneaker business, in corporate America, and in the entertainment world. So we just share fun stories of all the celebrities we've worked with. We talk about some of the marketing programs that we helped launch. We discuss some of the hurdles that we've had. So it's the good, the bad, the ugly. But more than anything, we hope to just inspire that next generation of leaders to know what's possible. You know, when we started the podcast, I wasn't particularly interested in doing it in complete transparency. Um, you know, in, in some of the spaces that I'm in, it, it's hard to come back and then talk about it because it seems like you're bragging, right? It seems okay. like, oh, you just, you know, we're trying to show off. So I've never, some of these stories that you're going to hear, I have never, ever talked about. And Muhammad approached me one, at one point and she said, you know, if we don't tell our story, right, if we don't talk about what we've done and the fact that, you know, we've accomplished a lot in our careers, given sort of where we came from. She grew up in Philly. I grew up in Compton. She went to Howard. I went to Grambling. If we don't tell about working at Key and about being, you know, she was a casting director at one point. I booked, you know, talent for Motorola commercials and just all sorts of things. Uh, who is gonna know? Like, who's gonna know that you were here basically is what she was saying. Right. When she framed it that way and I could wrap my mind around it, then I was all for it. And I think we have probably, you know, 20 plus episodes uh, right now talking about our dealings with everybody from Madonna to, uh, Usher to Destiny's Child, Justin Timberlake. Uh, we haven't really talked a lot about our sports uh, relationships much, but I think probably in this coming season, uh, we will. Um, we talk about you know how we sort of launched this kind of notion of influencer and influencer marketing. Uh, we talk about uh, you know being 
in some really funny spaces where, you know, we once brought a whole bunch of snow to the forum in LA to do a snowboarding event with Eminem. I mean, so just- Snowboarding. Yeah, it was really super cool. Um, so there were snowboarders and then there was M performing. Um, so if you love a good kiki and are interested in how to navigate. So, so we're using our own experience. It just happens to be sports and entertainment. But some of the lessons that we've learned will definitely translate if you're working in finance, if you're working in tech, if you're in the medical profession. Because I think the one shared experience that we're having is this a very unique one of being a Black woman in these spaces um, or being Black men in these spaces. And so, yeah, so it's the Soul Chronicles. You can get it everywhere that you get all your other podcasts. Fantastic. And I'm so glad you said that because I had the enjoyment that you shared with me, the address of it, and I just was blown away. And I, I just find that we, in particular in this industry, I'm understanding we don't communicate enough about sharing what we're doing that is putting out a positive message. Hence, going back to the communication. And I want people to hear the brilliance of the Soul Chronicles. In addition to, I think, in supporting one another, we only help one another to grow even more. And, and part of our growth is the education of what we're all doing, sharing that information. No, absolutely. And, you know, at some point we hope to take our show on the road. So if people are looking for really cool, fun, different ways to enhance some of their employee engagement, um, Muhammad and I you know, are available to speak at any corporation to talk about how to be successful in work, how to balance work life. Um, so it's just really exciting to see what started as just like, hey, we should share our stories to people pinging us saying, when's the next episode coming? I will tell you, the next episode is so super juicy. And okay. uh, we're interviewing- Are we getting inside details? We're getting inside details? You this, we haven't promoted it yet, but I'll tell okay. you, we're interviewing a, a man who is an icon in celebrity protection. His name is Big Bob Fontenot. He comes from Compton. And he has literally traveled the world with every celebrity from Beyonce. Um, he was Whitney Houston's private uh, bodyguard as well, or executive oh, wow. um, head of executive protection. Um, and he talks about what that life is like. So number one, he talks about how to get into that industry. So that's very important. Uh, he has a company, Hedge of Protection, where he's grooming the next generation of young black men and women in executive protection. So that's very important. But he shares so many stories, especially with some of our higher profile African-American celebrities getting in a little bit of trouble these days. And we're hearing all over social media, their executive um, security <clears throat> teams and details sharing out all of these details. He uh, sort of brings us a different perspective and he shares out some really emotional stories, some sort of behind the scene things um, that I think the audience is gonna find so compelling. And it's a part of the industry that we never really get to look at because these guys are there, they're huge, they're big. They're kind of what's standing in between you and your favorite celebrity. Um, but the things they hear, see, experience, it's sort of a bird's eye view that the average person doesn't have access to. So we'll, we're excited to bring you that next episode. So I'll be sure to ping you when it's live. Please do. I, I feel like that would be completely interesting and enthralling. I'm extremely oh, so excited about that. Absolutely. Okay. And then, so I, I, this is one of my go down questions for sure. I am very curious. You mentioned music, so we're going to get to that. But spirituality plays a huge role in the encouragement and where we're motivated and building our foundation. So in spirituality, how does that play a role? And it's open to interpretation for all. Everyone has their paths that they follow. But where does spirituality play a role in your profession and or in your personal life? You know, it's such a great question. And thank you for raising that. Absolutely. Um, I think as whole people, fully realized people, usually we have several facets, right? So it's not just the person you see sitting here in front of you today, just these experiences. It's the totality. And for me, faith is one of my favorite words because, number one, it's a center, right? It's sort of like, where do you draw your strength? You know, who are you? Why are you here in the earth? What are you set to do to accomplish? And what is your North, North Star? 
for me, I grew up in church. I grew up oh, yeah. at Mount Beulah Baptist Church in Watts, California, across the What'd street from the Gardens Projects. Oh, yeah. And we were the kind of family that was, you know, Sunday school, regular church service, and then after the church service, another church service, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and I grew up in church, and that's really number one where I learned faith. I learned about the Bible, and I learned it from the standpoint of like, this is just not some fairy tale. I learned it from the standpoint that these are real people. They actually lived and existed. And here are some of the tools that you can use to help guide you in your life. Here are some of the scriptures. Here are some of the prayers that you can help guide you in your life. And it really has been such a huge benefit and help for my life because, you know, we talked a lot here about successes. And a Absolutely. lot of what I've done in my life that's been successful and it's been great. And we touched on some of the places I've been. And that's wonderful. And I'm super grateful for that. However, I don't care how way, well laid your plans are. I don't care what kind of strategy you have. It doesn't matter the people you know. I don't even care how much you've invested in your education, how much you've studied about a particular field. Failure is inevitable. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't care what anybody you find me one successful person who has entered into an endeavor of any sort and they have not met with a certain level of failure and i will pay you something it's really unrealistic to believe that in this life everything is going to be smooth sailing that is not true and for me what has given me that tenacity that stick to that sort of again mentality try again you know, get up, do it again, believe again, is having this faith in knowing that I am not on my own. That Ooh. although I have a beautiful family, I have amazing friends, amazing network of people in my life that at the end of the day, in some form or fashion, you find yourself alone with yourself and with your creator. Oh, wow. And there are certain things that can only be answered and worked out in that environment, right? Nobody is really coming to save us, save Jesus Christ, right? So the reality is in this life, you have to have an inner sort of conviction and constitution about who you are, where you come from. And for me, it first starts with a spiritual plane, like being a spiritual being, having a human experience. And then what is that spirituality connected to? Right. And then how do we walk that out every day um, in our in our life? So I could go on and on. I could talk to you forever about faith. But for me, it is my my guiding star. It is, you know, when you talk about audacity, because we started there, it yes. is connected for me directly to faith, because that's what gives me the audacity, because I know I can do all things yeah. right. Because Christ strengthens me. Full that's circle, full circle. In my belief. And so that gives me the audacity that God created everything and I have a direct connection to that source. So surely I can be, do anything. I choose to leave a footprint that I hope is really centered in love and connection um, and in positivity, right? But it's all sort of centered around that faith. Um, and that's what gives me the strength and the audacity to believe that I can really accomplish anything. It also gives me that desire to want to help other people. You you could have picked a better selection of words uh, because I think uh, uh, similar to our conversations today and our consider our times, faith is a word that's used very lightly, but it continues to pack a powerful punch. And it is a substantive word that I think is undervalued and underestimated because I feel guided by that same, not just word, but that concept and that spiritual foundation. I'm so glad you addressed faith in particular as a part of what being audacious is and that audacity to move forward. I, I, I'm just so glad. And you actually gave some inspiration to me in, in a whole different way that I hadn't challenged before. And we'll talk offline about that. But, <laughs> no, but absolutely. I, absolutely. You know, I, you know, again, the thoughts expressed here are purely Nikita's. They do not reflect me at all. I Absolutely. don't believe that education is the great equalizer. I think it is an equalizer. I think it's an important one. But for me, I think faith is the great equalizer. 
I, I believe that there is nothing that faith cannot dismantle and that faith, mm. there's no place that faith can't take you, right? There's some doors that even with a brilliant education, you still won't be able to unlock because of all That's sorts right. of reasons. But with faith, there is no limit, right? That's right. And so that is sort of my guiding principle. And I do believe that that is the source of whatever sort of success that I've been able to have um, yeah, in my in my life. I, I just love that. And, and it's it's becoming my go to question, because I think at our core and you mentioned that our spirituality, whatever that might be, and people can have their own determinations as far as what fits for them. But at our core, our spirituality is the I think the biggest part of what makes us a whole person, and it is incorporated to everything we do. Where even uh, it can be controversial, but atheism is a somewhat spiritual belief system. Mm -hmm. So whatever that Absolutely. might be. So I, I like to address this question because it's it tends to be a part of who we are and who we have become and who we're becoming. Now, along with that, in an off kind of way, is so now you mentioned music and the arts. So you know let's let's hear it number one all-time musical artist because we didn't say and not group yet but musical artists and and or they can be dead or alive oh my gosh that is so hard you can how about this i'll give you this shot you can even put a tie may a two-way tie maybe a three-way tie okay so hmm so let me start here so in gospel, right? Yes. You can't get any better than Fred Hammond. Like he I'll, is I'll it. the it all go to for me, right? Oh, yeah. um, I think in just in general, who I don't know. It's so hard because I love everybody from you know Aretha Franklin, Shaka Khan, Patti LaBelle. Uh, I appreciate Mary J. Blige. Um, you know, I I mean, I don't hate on Beyonce. I mean, I kind of like <laughs> okay. I, I like Beyonce. Um, yeah. I mean, no I, sexy red in there? Not for me. I mean, I don't, it doesn't really resonate with me. I mean, although I will sing a Cardi B bar or two. I mean, I have been known to, you know, in the confines of my own car. Uh, but yeah, no. So, uh, so yeah. So I love uh, Whitney Houston. Was just a brilliant talent, and I don't think she could, you know, hit a wrong note if she tried. You know, when she was at her height and at her best. So, so yeah, just a a lot of different artists. Uh, it's hard. I'm not really a person who has like a fan mentality. But okay. I do appreciate, um, so Janet Jackson, I mean, there's just oh. like something about the entertainment value and, yes. uh, you know, just being able to be sort of that consummate performer that I can appreciate. Prince, of course, Michael oh, Jackson. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so I just have a lot of favorites. <laughs> Uh, and I do too. So I definitely with you on that. And and sometimes it, it does get hard. I think I challenge that question sometimes to see, um, you know, who is the most immediate person, but there, I, me, myself as a music lover, sometimes it very, di it becomes difficult to dwindle it down to. So your first. Okay. Well, who are your, who's your number one and number two? So my number one, for sure, for sure, for sure. Has, so in gospel, James Cleveland. Oh, well, yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm old school. And then I had the privilege of meeting Andre Crouch at an oh, Ikea yes. store. <laughs> you did in Ikea? Yes, and I ended up going to their church for years. And Sandra, she, you know, she was a huge encouragement in a couple of different ways because when I was a kid and saw Color Purple and Tata Vega, uh, she's been a friend ah, of mine for yes. years. And so I had my sister, my older sister introduced me to them. And I just in gospel music, it was very difficult to get past James Cleveland, the Crouch Singers, Absolutely. Mississippi Mass Choir. Oh, so that's in gospel. Mississippi having you there. Made the oh, difference. you know, what? oh, you know, and you know, and then Tamala <laughs> changed me, Lord. That's Tamala. Yes. Who, yeah. And change oh, me again. Yeah. OK. And yes. And we can do this so, all day. 
<laughs> oh yeah, we could. Oh yeah, and that's in gospel. And then the secular music, secular music. Okay. Uh, you know, I love me some good jazz. Miles Davis is definitely yes. up there for me. Blue, and then I, I'm definitely a huge, huge Seal fan. People be surprised. Oh, I love it. Oh, I have Seal. a good Seal story. I have a really. Oh, good dig story. it. We have yeah. time. So when I was at Nike, Seal would come in, and you know, he was a great friend of the brand, and I was petrified of dogs. I had an aunt who lives in Vegas. My whole family's in Vegas. I love Vegas. That's a whole nother thing. She had a little chihuahua named Chi Chi. I never had a problem with Chi Chi at all. I didn't really like dogs that much, but Chi Chi was cool. One day I was minding my own business. Chi Chi was next to me and I was petting her and she was fine with that. But the minute that I drew my hand back to stop petting her, she bit me. And from that moment on, I had an aversion to dogs. Like, I don't care, small, big. I mean, Chi Chi bit me and she was like a little chihuahua. So I just didn't do dogs. So Seal came in and he was talking to me about something and somehow his dog came up and I was like, oh yeah, I don't do dogs. I'm scared of dogs. I can't do it. He's like, okay, next time I come, I'm bringing my dog and we're going to get over this. And I was like, don't bring your dog in here because I do not like dogs. <laughs> he goes up with the biggest dog I have ever seen in my life. I can't even to this day tell you what type of dog it was, but let's just say it looked like a Great Dane and it was like to my shoulder almost. I'll never forget it. It was black. His name was Bismarck. And he made me pet hit the dog. He let the dog stay there throughout our whole appointment, throughout our whole conversation. The dog was just there. And ever since then, I have loved dogs. And I have since then had two dogs. And I have Go a little multi poo right now. <laughs> Go for Oh, that's right. Because you're a fur baby mom, too. That's my fur baby is Bijou. So, oh, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So that's that's my a great story. story. Oh, he, I've seen him in concert four times and, um, it just, he was so part underrated, of my, right? Just so underrated. So I really do. I think underrated, underappreciated. He's, yes, yeah, I love that. Underappreciated. He, That's oh, good. Uh, under, very much underappreciated, but Coldplay, the Beatles. Mm, okay. Um, oh yeah. Fishbone. I met Fishbone oh, when yes. I was homeless. He, he bought me a chicken and people don't remember Fishbone because I love rock and roll too. A fishbone. I was sleeping in the park a lot at Ralph's in Hollywood, on, uh -huh. on Hollywood Boulevard. I was in my car, my head against the window, and I was sleeping in the car for about, at that point, about five days in a row. And I tried to put some newspapers up, and I was just trying every day to get a new job and so forth. And tapped on my little Pinto window. I had a blue Pinto. <laughs> yeah. And fishbone said, "Yo, brother, what's up?" And I was already like. Yo, I know that's fish. Did you know who he was? I, I knew who he was because I'm an MTV kid. Mm. And so I had a, I had, you know, cult of personality and a number of different cats were part of my whole music scene in the rock music, especially black music, rock musicians. And he said, what's up, bro? And I said, I'm good. I'm good. He said, hold on a minute. I'm thinking, I know that's Fishbone. He came back out 10 minutes later because I'm still in the park lot. He bought me roasted chicken and an orange crush. And I never will forget that. And he said, brother, you know, you don't have to be out here. I said, I know. I wish I wasn't. And had a conversation. I never will forget that day. Uh, and so How that was a big part amazing. of it for me. How yes. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, what yeah. a little bit yeah. of kindness can do. It really, I tell you, that, that was part of it. And then the second portion of kindness was I was sleeping in Venice in a parking lot on Lincoln Boulevard. And a woman, and she was Caucasian. And same thing, I had moved there and had the things up on my car and she saw me sleeping there. I opened a door to get out and she and she was a tiny thing, couldn't have been 90 pounds. And I'm a black man. And she said, if you help me with my groceries, I'll give you twenty five dollars. Now, she could have been completely afraid of me because I'm sleeping in the park a lot and everything. And she wasn't. She mm. took an opportunity on me at knowing I was sleeping in my car homeless. She wasn't afraid of me. And I helped her with her groceries, brought them to her door. She gave me $25. I went back to my car, and I never will forget this. I thought, okay, is she going to call the cops, or is she going to tell me to move from there? I slept there two more days. The second day, I, I was in my car, and she came out. She said, you know, here's the number to a shelter and so forth, and tried to give me a hand. And I was young, much younger at that point, about 22. And I just can't believe, be, forget the look in her eyes as she felt it wasn't pity and it wasn't feeling sorry and it wasn't fear. She said, I'm going to help this person. And it taught me a lesson 
and about a long-term empathy that I feel God has put into all of us, black, white, Asian, and different, because I'm six foot. I'm not necessarily an overly intimidating presence, but as a black man, as she's a tinier woman, she could have felt that, but she did not. And she gave me a hug as I said, oh, you know, I'm leaving this area today. And she gave me a hug and I went about my way. And I never forget that, that she took that moment to show that kindness. And it was not, it wouldn't have been out of the realm. I would have known no different had she passed me by or called the police, I had expected that but she chose not to. And the kindness that God has cultivated for me in the love that we all have in our spirit, because I was homeless for a while, that she showed to me, it further built a foundation about the kindness of all of us, mm. all of us, that if we believe in that, and my dad and mom both were people of faith, and I had that faith, but I had not seen it to such a magnitude where a woman who could have totally wished ill upon me and or scared away from me, did not. And it's not just the kindness of white to black or any of that. It was just two human, be human beings. And that, had, that has stuck with me. And so that was a big part of my one love and knowing that God has all of us to want to communicate a love message to each other. And so to me, I always try and communicate all of us are a part of that big family. And so it has stayed with me to a great deal. So oh, I love that. that being oh, thank it. you for sharing Absolutely. your story and being so vulnerable with us. I know that's going to 100 percent inspire somebody who might be I in so. that predicament today. But but for those of us who aren't, I think it will inspire us to be more kind when we do. I hope so. Encounter those people. You know, I have a dream that one day we're all going to go back to our factory setting. And that is. Oh, I love that. Our factory yeah. setting. Our basic, when we are born, I mean, we are just born human and we know how to be yes. human at that point. I mean, yes. no one is with a manual telling us how to be a basic, decent human being. We know it. Um, I think it's the things that we long and learn along the way that take us so far from who we were originally created to be that causes a need for diversity, and equity, equity and inclusion, causes a need for you know gay rights, causes a need for um, equity. Well, it's because you've gotten Absolutely. so far away from your factory setting that now you're no longer human and you're resembling something else. Um, because when you seek to infringe upon the rights of other people or when you dismiss someone's basic humanity because they may be um, experiencing, you know, housing insecurity or whatever, you know, they're maybe mentally, you know, unstable, may have addiction. People may have all kinds of issues. But when you allow yourself to see them as anything other than human, Right? Mm -hmm. Even in the workplace, even in the corporate environment, when in the corporate environment, when you see a certain group of people as less than you, for whatever reason, then I think you've gotten so far from your original setting. And my my goal and my dream is that one day I can see a place and a time where people are so desperate to get back to that original setting um, that that's going to create an incredible environment for everybody. So I, I love the fact that. that she saw your humanity. I believe that. And it goes to one of my other favorite artists, Bob Marley. Oh, uh, yes. I saw both um, the documentaries that are out right now. Oh, I have seen everything and had the pleasure of working with the family. That I can't even tell you enough. The love that he has inspired in me, how I've worked with thousands of kids to teach that. Karis One, Dougie Fresh, mm -hmm. Pharaoh Ooh. Munch. Oh, yes. Pharaoh Munch, because I am a hip hop head. So yeah. those are some of the artists that, as a man of color, on this Juneteenth, Juneteenth, I celebrate them as well as some of my favorite musicians that I can't go without saying. Absolutely. I must say, this has been one of the most uh, encouraging, inspiring, heroic conversations I've had. And no disrespect to my previous guests, I just have told, I just said to a number of my friends and loved ones how excited I was to speak to you today and how enlightening this conversation would be, not only because of your physical beauty, but your spiritual beauty and your professionalism and what you've accomplished on Juneteenth, our ancestors and all those women and men who have brought both of us to you and I meeting at this point. I am looking forward to what we continue to do in building for our loved ones, our people and honoring their memories. I celebrate you, Nikita. I celebrate you and honor you for presenting yourself with us to us today and sharing with us what you what you have done. And I thank you sincerely from my heart for being here today. And what I'd like to do is 
anyone of the Make Us Bar audience, of the LinkedIn audience, of Instagram, and all the social media platforms that we're a part of, please do check out Nikita. Nikita, please list the number of ways they can reach out to you and look forward to being in connect, uh, connectivity with you because we will continue this friendship and build upon this as our network continues to grow. And I'm looking forward to our friendship and relationship flourishing. How can people reach out to you and get further in contact with you, not only your podcast, but your businesses and or shared information as a resource? Absolutely. First of all, thank you for all the kindness you've extended toward me for the care and the absolute sort of gracious way that you've conducted the interview. Thank you so very much. Um, I have to say that. Uh, secondly, I think people can- You don't have to say it. You don't have to say it, but I'm glad you did. I need to say it. I want to say it. It has to be said. <laughs> um, there's so many people that you could have asked to be here today. And so I don't take it for granted that you've asked me. Um, so yes, I must say thank you. I think, uh, so how can people get in touch with me? So I'm at Nikita yes. on Instagram, uh, on LinkedIn. I'm Nikita Newell Hall. The, the podcast is The Soul Chronicles, S-O-L-E. Uh, if you're interested in working with Strut to help build your brand, we are, uh, I am Nikita at strutagency.com. And if you're interested in partnering, helping kids get new shoes for school, uh, we're always looking for funders and people who can help us to fund this work. I'm Nikita at shoesthatfit.org. I think that's all. The Thank you, Nikita. And Nikita, would you do me a favor? Absolutely. So Estancia or Netta, she is a long time, my si little sister-in-law. She's one of your admirers. If you can give her a shout out, she'd love it. She Aww. had a podcast a little bit ago and she's been such an inspiration to uh, helping raise my son when I had to do so. And she's one of the ones I told her about this interview. If you can give her a shout out, that'd be great. She is Netta Henderson or Estancia. She, I told her uh, she's going to be excited about this interview and don't be surprised if she reach out, reaches out oh. to you as well. Estancia, how wonderful. That is so sweet. Um, thank you for following along in my career. I mean, I'm really empowered by people like you who are an encouragement to me, <laughs> even though we've never met Netta. Um, I would love for you to reach out to me on any of my social channels, or you can get my personal email from Seth, and I would love to be in touch. Thank you so much. That has really sort of brightened my, my day today. So thanks for, for the support. Um, and Seth, thank you for sharing that with me. It's so sweet. It has been my pleasure. Nikita, my beautiful lady of today and tomorrow, I just thank you for honoring Maker's Bar with your presence today. Thank you so much for sharing your life experiences and giving us this opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. I would love to leave your listeners with just one thing, and that is start where you are with what you have. What you have is oh, enough. Goodness couldn't have said it better. One Love Family, on behalf of Makers Bar and all its affiliates, we truly thank you. Remember what I always say at the end of the day, come, be present, exist, and show that you are visible just by your presence. All good love to all of you. Good blessings this day. From Makers Bar, it's your boy, Seth Guru Baxter. One love. God bless and peace. Nikita, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye now. <laughs> Thank you.